As you know, in early 2020, many countries were under lockdown to slow the spread of the coronavirus. So that means that people were spending a lot of time at home. So I'm going to do some research and I'm going to test the hypothesis that people gained a little bit of weight when they were home for weeks and weeks on end. So that is my alternative hypothesis that people weigh more after the quarantine ends versus when the quarantine just started. And then the null hypothesis is that people's weight doesn't change at all from before compared to after the lockdown. Now, you know from a couple of videos ago on sampling variability that if we go out and measure a bunch of people and we, we ask people to weigh themselves and report the answer, we're going to get slightly different answers if we ask a, a different group of people. So there's going to be some natural variability. Some people will gain some weight, some people will lose some weight, and some people's weights won't change at all. Now, that's true, that sampling variability is true regardless of whether the null hypothesis is true or whether the alternative hypothesis is true. So how can we distinguish between them? That's the idea of a p-value and doing inferential statistics. So we say, if the null hypothesis is true and people's weights don't change at all during the quarantine, then we still expect some distribution of weights in the population just because of sampling variability. Of course, some people gain weight, some people lose weight, but at, at the aggregate level, at the population level, there is no effect overall on, um, uh, of the quarantine on, on people's weights. On the other hand, if the alternative hypothesis is true, we still expect some variability, but we expect the distribution of people's weights to be shifted to the right because they're gaining a little bit of weight. You know, stress eating, people are enjoying ice cream while watching Netflix, you know how it goes. Now, this is a little bit theoretical here. The thing is, we don't actually collect a huge number of samples we only collect maybe one sample of 50 people. So let's say this is the average weight difference from 50 people after the quarantine versus before the quarantine starts. Now, we, don't, we cannot actually measure data for the null hypothesis because in, that's why we're doing the research. We don't know if the null hypothesis or the alternative hypothesis is true. So what we do instead is make an assumption. We say, I am going to imagine that if the null hypothesis is really true, I expect that the distribution is going to look like this. That's based on some assumptions that the distribution will be shaped like a bell curve, like a normal distribution. It's based on assumptions about how wide this distribution is. So we have to make some assumptions and then we come up with our null hypothesis distribution. Remember this null hypothesis distribution, this comes from a model. This comes from a, a formula that we derive. This line here, this is an actual piece of data that we really measured out there in the world. So this is real data and this is a theory that's based on our assumptions. So then what we want to know is what is the chance that we could have observed a value like this in the real data if the null hypothesis were actually true? So you can see even if the null hypothesis were really true, we can still get some values where it looks like people gained weight even though they didn't and that's just because of sampling variability so you can imagine these two cases and so you know the question is how likely is the alternative hypothesis value to occur how likely are we to get this measurement in the data if the null hypothesis is really true Here's just another way of phrasing that same question. What is the probability of observing a parameter estimate of the null hypothesis value given that there is no true effect? Well, you know, looking at it here, we say it's pretty unlikely to get this value if the null hypothesis is true. It's not impossible, it's just unlikely. And here we say it's pretty likely. So if the null hypothesis is true, we certainly expect that this value here is going to be well within the range of our sampling variability. So this is the idea of a p-value. A p-value is the probability that we observed a value that we actually got in our data if the null hypothesis is really true. 
Remember, this is an assumption. We, we are using a formula to derive the null hypothesis distribution, and this comes from our data that we're, we really collect from the outside world. So that's the idea of a p-value. It's the probability that we could have observed our own data if the null hypothesis is really true. Now here is an important concept in statistics. We cannot actually prove that the null hypothesis is true. That's not what we're doing with our statistical models. That's what we would like to do as researchers. That's kind of the goal of science to prove the, these models. But that's not what we actually do with statistics. Instead, with statistics, what we do is compute the probability that these values could have arisen under the null hypothesis. Now, we have uh, these probabilities and they result from our statistical evaluations. The probability values range from zero to one and values that are really far away from this distribution are close to zero and values that are really close to the center of this distribution are close to one. This would also be have a very small probability value by the way. So if our actual results that we really observed in the data are really far away from our null hypothesis distribution, then we get a small p-value and we say that the effect is significant. It's unlikely that we would have observed this effect under the null hypothesis. Now how small does this p-value have to be? Well, that's what's given to us by this thing called the significance threshold. So if the p-value is, is smaller than the significance threshold, then we call the finding statistically significant. So that would be here. This finding is, is, the value of the finding is greater than the significance threshold, so the probability is smaller than the significance threshold p-value. And then we say that it's statistically significant. And if our value is not greater than the significance threshold, we would call this not statistically significant. Now, it's important to realize that these thresholds are arbitrary. People often use values like 0.05 or 0.01. Those are common values, but it is important to realize that uh, these thresholds are arbitrary. There's nothing out there in the universe that says that 0.05 is the threshold that makes something significant. We as humans, we as scientists and statisticians and data analysts, we have collectively decided that these thresholds are reasonable, although we accept that they are not perfect.